caffeine is a misunderstood drug. Certainly, it's everyone, a drug, right? You use the term drug, is, and that's interesting. It is a drug. Um, it's what we call a psychoactive stimulant. Um, everyone knows that caffeine can help alert you and sort of keep you awake. That's the thing that's most known. Um, caffeine, if you look at some data, is probably the second most traded commodity on the surface of the planet after oil, which I think says everything about our wow. sleep-deprived state. The other thing about caffeine, however, that most people don't realize is the time that it is in your system. So most drugs have what we call a half-life, the amount of time it takes for half of that drug to be essentially excreted out your system. Caffeine has a half-life of about six or seven hours, and it's a little dependent on what type of gene that you have to sort of metabolize the caffeine, but on average, it's about that. But what's interesting is that caffeine has a quarter life of about 12 hours. What this means is that if you have a cup of coffee at noon, a quarter of that caffeine is still circulating around your brain at midnight. Wow. So to put that in context, it would be the equivalent of getting into bed and just before you turn the light out, you swig a quarter of a cup of Starbucks and you hope for a good night of sleep. <laughs> It, you know, you would never do that because, yeah. you know, but that's exactly, unfortunately, what people do, you know, um, completely innocently by drinking caffeine, you know, still too late in the afternoon. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a huge problem. It, yeah. It's it's a, I, th I think it's a big problem in society. If you, I mean, another way to quantify this is if you just look and I've checked out the data from the Financial Times, the number of Starbucks coffee houses that have arisen <laughs> over the past 30 years is just like an exponential increase. And I think that is an expression of how we're self-medicating our state of sleep deprivation in developed nations. And well, Catholic uh, culture is just growing it, you know, exponentially yeah. now, right? It's the new, you know, I, I talk about something, it's almost like a new new pub culture. It's cafe culture. Yeah. You, know, you hang out with your friends, you meet up, you get your drink. Typically, it'll be a caffeinated drink. Yeah. Um, we've now got school kids, you know, I saw in a local village I was walking through recently, you know, after school, you know, I popped into a cafe to get, I think, uh, a bottle of water. Uh, I can't really remember, but I, I popped in and I saw a group of school kids. They must have been maybe 13 or 14 after school. They're sitting in the cafe with their caffeinated drinks, you know, doing their homework together, catching up, whatever. I thought, wow, you know, this has become endemic in society now. We, you know, you call it a drug. I agree with you. It is a psychoactive substance that we... You know, we, we use liberally. We let our children have it. We, you know, we're not even, you know, we often don't think about the implications of that. And so many patients of mine tell me that, Dr. Chachi, I know, you know, if caffeine can be a problem for some people, I'm not one of those. Caffeine is fine for me. But more often than not, when they either reduce their intake or cut it out completely, the sleep quality goes up. Yeah. And, um, uh, and, you know, Sachin Panda, um, Professor Panda, who, you know, I know you know very well, you both sort of follow each other's research. He was on the podcast a few weeks ago and, you know, he was saying routinely every year he will he will have a bit of a detox from caffeine. He'll go off caffeine. And he says, when I do that, yeah, I have a headache for a few days, but my sleep always improves. I've got more energy and my productivity dramatically increases. And I think that says it all, really. It does. And, I, you know, a number of points that you made that I'd love to circle back around to. Firstly, caffeine is the only psychoactive stimulant that we do give to our children readily, which, you know, is, I think, a concern. And I'm not trying to be sort of, you know, finger pointing or finger wagging. Again, I think it's just that parents probably don't understand the impact of caffeine in that regard. Um, I think the the second point comes on to your comment of some people say, look, I'm one of those people who can drink a cup of coffee in the evening, have an espresso after dinner. And I fall asleep fine and I stay asleep. Now, even if that's true, there was an alarming study that was done where they gave people just one single cup of coffee, a dose of 200 milligrams of caffeine, standard cup of coffee. And then they measured the quality of their deep sleep by tracking these big, powerful brain waves, these glorious, beautiful, deep brain waves that bathe um, uh, all of our brain during deep sleep at night. And it helps also restore the body. And what they found was that just one dose of caffeine in the evening decreased the amount of deep sleep by 20%. Now, you would have to normally age by about 15 years to produce that type of a deficit in your deep sleep, or you can do it every single night by having a cup of coffee. And what's interesting is that those people will wake up the next morning, 
They won't remember waking up because they may not have woken up, but the quality of their deep sleep was so poor that they will still then feel unrestored and unrefreshed by their sleep. I need they, more caffeine. <laughs> and and so the, here is the irony that now they're starting to reach for two cups of coffee rather than one, and so develops this dependency cycle, this sort of addiction spiral, as it were. So I think people are perhaps unaware of the the true impact of caffeine, how long it sticks around within your system, and even if you feel that you're immune to that evening cup of coffee, how it will still impact your sleep, even though consciously you know nothing about it. Well, I think you know you raise a really important point there, Matthew, about you know knowledge and awareness. You know, none of us are pointing fingers. You know, we. Yeah. You know, I understand caffeine is everywhere. You know, I probably used to overdrink caffeine uh, and I've altered my behavior as I've learned more and more about the research. And I think what we're trying to do is raise awareness of, you know, caffeine is a sleep disruptor. There's just no question about that. And, you know, we can dress it up any way we want, but it is a sleep disruptor. So if anyone is listening to this, if that story that Matthew just mentioned resonates with you, I'd really sort of encourage you to have a little think about your caffeine usage and just see if can you you can you wind it down a little bit? Can you see, you know, bit by bit, if by reducing it, it improves your quality of sleep? The recommendation I make in my book is enjoy your caffeine before noon. And I say enjoy because I get it. People love it. I love a good cup of coffee, but I will not have caffeine after midday. Yeah. And I, you know, I've now actually done what Sachin has done. I, I would I routinely go through sort of a caffeine detox. Um, and right now I'm caffeine free. But, you know, I too would enjoy that cup of coffee or a nice strong cup of, you know, um, Yorkshire tea. Uh, I have no relationship with them, by the way, um, in the mornings. And I also love the the coffee culture as well. You know, I go out with friends and we grab coffee all the time. And I love that. And I, I want people to embrace it because I think it's fantastic that there's a social movement sort of circulating around that. Um all I would say, though, is that, you know, decaffeinated coffee is is actually really quite good. And I would struggle, and I'd love to do the sort of, the, you know, the Coke Pepsi challenge with decaf and caffeinated. Just in terms of the taste, you will probably notice that it wouldn't give you sort of the shakes or that sort of slightly anxious state. And you probably know the difference. But I've really become enamored with decaffeinated coffee and wow. all of its flavors. And I love the cafe bar culture. So love to embrace that. But I do like what you're saying uh, about you sort of patients just thinking a little bit about caffeine and considering it and just trying to try the experiment, you know, sort of set yourself the task, give it a go and see if it works for you. Yeah, I, I remember about a month after my book came out, uh, someone tweeted me and said, I, I never, ever thought that caffeine was a problem for me, but I've, I've read your book. I've taken your recommendation. I've, I've how I now only have two cups of coffee and I have it before noon and I've never slept this well in over 30 years. And it's just incredible how such a common thing that people are doing day to day may be impacting our sleep. And I think you make a really good point that it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more caffeine you drink, the more you need, the more dependent you become, the less good your sleep is. And, And it just continues. I think we also have to highlight, we're talking about coffee, but I think tea, yeah, would be similar because it contains caffeine. Green tea, you know, a herbal tea that often people switch to when they're not having tea or coffee is also a highly caffeinated drink, so may affect you. You mentioned decaf coffee. You know, I've read some reports are saying that decaf coffee does contain some caffeine. Do you know much yeah. about that? So decaffeinated coffee is not no caffeinated coffee. <laughs> so you do have to be, uh, you know, somewhat mindful of that. Um, And they looked and you can sort of search around on the internet. There's some good sites that will describe exactly how much. Some brands have very little caffeine at all. Um, Other brands, however, I was surprised to find can have up to 20% uh, caffeine in. So you have five cups of those, you know, and you're well on your way to a standard cup of coffee. So you do have to be a little bit careful. Um, But it's certainly a good way if you're thinking about trying to come off caffeine to sort of psychologically still treat yourself with that pleasure. And and it tastes Uh, great, right? Yeah, it does. It it really, it's not too bad. So caffeine is something that a lot of us do in the morning. Um, We're also going to talk a little bit later about alcohol, which is something that people often use in the early evening or late evening to help them unwind for bed. But 
You know, before we go deep into alcohol, because I think that's something that people are incredibly fascinated about, because I think that whole term of the nightcap, you know, people, <laughs> it's there in, in our vernacular now, how it's something that can help you just slip off into sleep. Or can it? We'll, we'll find out <laughs> shortly. But, um, you know, listeners to my podcast know that I, I talk about these four key pillars of health that I think have the most impact on the way that we feel, but also that we've got some degree of control over. Mm food and movement, which people have been talking about for years, but also sleep and relaxation. Now, in your book, right at the start, you make a very powerful case why sleep is the foundational pillar of health. I'd love you to talk more about that. Yeah, you know, I used to think that sleep may be the third pillar of good health alongside diet and exercise. But the more I sort of did my research and the more I read from other people, I realized I was probably wrong that, in fact, sleep is the foundation on which those two other things sit. Um, and I'll give you an example in each. Firstly, for diet and exercise, we know that if people are trying to lose weight and they're being judicious about their food intake, they're trying to um, diet, but they're not getting sufficient sleep. 70% of all the weight that they lose will come from lean muscle mass and not fat. Wow. Because your body becomes very stingy in giving up its fat when you are underslept. So dieting becomes, you know, quite redundant in that regard. You know, you, you want to keep the muscle, you want to let go of the fat and sleep deprivation will do the opposite to you. So that's the first thing. It's a foundational element on which, you know, nutrition sits. And by the way, I'd love to talk all about sort of diet, appetite, sort of increased caloric intake, increase in exactly what you desire to eat when you're underslept. There's great data there. But let me move over to activity. We've spoken about the foundation on which diet sits. When you are not sleeping sufficient amounts, firstly, the likelihood that you will actually exercise decreases significantly. Your motivation to be physically active drops away. Even if you are physically active, the intensity of your workout will not be as strong. So it's less effective and less efficient. Your things like your vertical jump height, your muscle contraction strength, even the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen in your respiratory systems, they get worse when you haven't slept. Wow. What's even more frightening, however, is that your risk for injury increases when you are exercising but not well slept. This is incredible. And they did a great study where they looked at um, some athletes across a season and then they tracked their sleep. And then they bucketed those athletes into the different amounts of sleep, nine hours, eight hours, seven hours, six hours. What they found was a linear relationship between less and less sleep and increasing risk for serious injury during a sports event. So there is yet another demonstration of how even if you're trying to be physically active but not getting sufficient sleep, it can be harmful. The beauty of that part of the relationship and the same for diet is that it's bi-directional. That if you actually, you know, improve your sleep, you can improve those two things. But conversely, those two things will improve sleep. If you enjoyed that clip, here's another powerful clip that I think you are really going to enjoy. Blood pressure comes down, joints seem to get better, bowel symptoms seem to get better. This is going to keep your eyesight. This is going to keep you from getting dementia, renal disease, peripheral vascular disease, and cancers. You are not your habits. You can do it.